This episode was suggested by several listeners, Nina and Bailey on Facebook, Michael via email, and Heather on Instagram. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. This episode contains discussions about torture, abuse, and enslavement. If that's not something you want to hear about, this may be a good episode to skip. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you've ever been to New Orleans or read anything about it, there's a moment in its history that has lived on in infamy since it occurred. This moment has also spawned numerous legends and ghost stories about the location where it took place and the person behind the dramatic event. That place is 1140 Royal Street, and that moment is a raging fire that broke out in the house in 1834 and revealed a horror kept secret within. The person was Madame Delphine Lalaurie. There are many versions of this legend, but the most consistent one goes that the fire broke out in the kitchen. The Lalaurie family, who owned the house, escaped to safety, but many neighbors gathered to try to fight the fire. When they entered the slave quarters, they discovered a torture chamber, where seven slaves were suspended in chains and bore marks of recent whipping, gouging, stabbing, and other atrocities. The slaves were so weak they had to be carried out of the house, and when the crowd saw them, they were horrified and appalled. There had been rumors that the lady of the house, Delphine Lollery, was often cruel to her slaves, but this was far beyond anything they had ever imagined. The crowd flew into a rage, but Lollery and her husband quickly escaped to their carriage as the house continued to burn. Infuriated by this escape from justice, the crowd became a mob and destroyed the house until nothing but a few walls remained standing. The Lollerys were never seen in New Orleans again. This story has intrigued me for some time, especially after working on the Elizabeth Bathory episode of the MCP. Her legend and Madame Lollerys seemed to have a lot in common, and I wondered if perhaps the Lollery legend was actually based on tales of Countess Bathory, just misconstrued over the years. As I researched Delphine Lollery, I discovered she was in fact a real person, and that the fire really did take place. The rest of the legend was more difficult to research, as the story has been repeated over the years, becoming more and more gruesome and embellished. I wanted documented evidence of what really happened. Eventually, I found it, and in this episode, I'm going to share those facts with you. The whole truth, however, will never be known, as we don't have anything written by Delphine herself, but we can make some evidence-based guesses as to what most likely happened. Before we get into the details about Delphine Lollery, I'd like to say something about this story and its characters. The victims of Delphine were not just slaves. They were people with names, families, and histories. Many times, the plight of enslaved peoples becomes trivialized or whitewashed in many of the morbid tales or ghost stories from the American South. It should be remembered that these people and most of the enslaved people of color from this time period suffered violence, harassment, and death by the hand of their white oppressors. They were looked on as inhuman chattel. While I'm going to tell the story of one woman who was reviled for the cruel treatment of her slaves, please keep in mind that millions of enslaved people suffered similar treatment and did not make it into the history books. It's not my intention to belittle or trivialize the very real horror and violence suffered by the victims of Delphine, 
I've done my best to find their names and as much information as I could about them in order to tell their stories. One author, Carolyn Morrow Long, has compiled as much information regarding the slaves and Delphine Lollery as possible from archives, public records, family collections of letters, and newspapers from the time. Her book, Madame Lollery, Mistress of the Haunted House, is the best, most thoroughly researched resource on this topic, and I highly recommend reading it if you want to know more. Delphine Lollery was born Marie Delphine Macarty on March 19, 1787. The Macarty family was a wealthy and socially powerful group of plantation owners, military officers, and merchants. Both Delphine's male and female relatives owned and managed extensive real estate and many slaves. Delphine's grandfather established his plantation in the 1760s near colonial New Orleans. Her father, Louis Barthélemy Macarty, who inherited part of the plantation, was knighted as Chevalier of the Royal Military Order of Saint Louis, and her mother, Marie Jeanne Laable, was the widow of a French merchant with a vast fortune of her own. She was well known to be, quote, frolicsome, end quote, and was famous for her raucous parties that all the social elite of the area attended. Delphine also had an older brother, also named Louis Barthélemy. The family lived in a French colonial manner on their plantation for most of Delphine's childhood. The socio-political climate in Louisiana at the time was tense. Most plantation owners lived in fear of slave rebellions, which occurred in the area from around 1790 to 1800. Louisiana was a French territory at the time, and while slavery had been outlawed previously, Napoleon had reinstated it. Many rebellions occurred because of this, and Delphine's uncle was one of several plantation owners who was killed by his slaves. There was also a yellow fever epidemic in 1796, which put many people, free and enslaved, in fear for their lives. Despite this, Delphine's family continued with their parties and gatherings. Her parents' relationship, however, was a stormy one. They were said to get into noisy fights and were close to separation at one point. It's also known Delphine's father was involved in a relationship with a free woman of color named Sophie, which at the time was known as keeping a concubine. He fathered several children with her, one of which was a daughter, also named Delphine. This relationship with Sophie could be part of the reason for the quarrels between her parents. In 1800, Louisiana became a Spanish territory. Because of the new Spanish regime in the colony, many Spanish officials arrived, and it was one of these men that Delphine married that same year at the age of 14. At the time, females of 12 and older were permitted to marry with permission from their parents, as they were thought to have sufficient discretion to decide to do so. Ramon López y Angulo de la Candelaria was a 35-year-old widower whose wife had died on his voyage to New Orleans in 1799. It's likely the two met at one of the many parties hosted by the Macarty family. In June of 1800, Lopez approached the Bishop of Louisiana, stating he was compelled to marry Delphine for reasons of, quote, honor and conscience, end quote. This suggests he had got Delphine pregnant, but there was no record of her having a child until a few years after the marriage. It's possible she lost the child, or there was some other need for their immediate marriage. Whatever the case, the wedding was a private affair on the plantation. Unfortunately, being an official of the Spanish crown, Lopez was supposed to have applied for the right to marry a local of Louisiana, and he married Delphine before he was given approval to do so. He was punished by being removed from his post and ordered back to Spain to face reprimand. Delphine set out with him in the spring of 1802. While they were gone, the Louisiana Territory was brought under French control once more and then sold to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. Once matters with Lopez were sorted out and he was made Spanish consul to New Orleans under the new American administration, he and Delphine boarded a ship home. Unfortunately, it capsized near Havana, Cuba in early 1805 and Lopez died. Delphine was heavily pregnant at the time and gave birth in Havana to a daughter, Borja. She had just turned 18, and Lopez had left her nothing, so she returned to the Macarty plantation. The first few years of American administration in Louisiana were confusing. 
There were many French and Spanish officials still in New Orleans, and the influx of Americans and their traditions, which were unknown to the local New Orleanians, created immediate animosity between Creoles, or natives of New Orleans, no matter their skin color, and the Americans. Delphine and her family were Creoles, but they held some support for the Spanish officials still left in New Orleans. In February of 1807, Delphine's mother died of natural causes, leaving her a large fortune, around $613,000 in today's currency. She was also left a plantation of her own and 52 slaves. On March 19, 1807, Delphine married Jean-Paul Blanc, a 43-year-old native of France who was a merchant, lawyer, banker, slave trader, and associate of pirates. In 1808, he purchased a house on Royal Street in New Orleans, and the two divided their time between the city and the plantation, both of which were said to be resorts for the social elite. It appears Delphine took after her mother in a love of lavish parties. It's unknown what type of relationship Delphine and Blanc had, but they did produce three daughters and a son, Pauline, Laura, Jeanne, and Pauline. Blanc died at age 50 in October of 1815. Delphine was now 28, with five children and a massive fortune of her own. Blanc had died in deep debt, thanks to his shadier business deals, which included slave smuggling, as the import of slaves from outside the U.S. had been banned by Thomas Jefferson in 1808. Delphine sold off all of Blanc's assets to pay off those debts, leaving her own intact. She was now a single, very wealthy, and said to be charming and beautiful woman. It was at this point she met Louis Nicolas Lallery, a 22-year-old French medical doctor, fresh out of university. He specialized in orthopedics, especially the correction of crooked backs, likely meaning scoliosis, kyphosis, and other malformations of the spine. He arrived in New Orleans in February of 1825. We aren't sure how they met, but Louis may have been treating Delphine's eldest daughter, Pauline who was mentioned in several historical documents as having some sort of physical disability. Either way, Delphine became pregnant by Louis and gave birth in August of 1827. They married in 1828, but there is no record of the type of relationship they had, whether it being born of lust and then marriage by duty, a patronage turned romantic, or some form of entrapment. Delphine was 40, and Louis was 25, this type of age gap, with the woman being older, was unheard of at the time. With the marriage, the two signed a marriage contract, and in this contract they declared both of their finances, and Delphine recorded an inventory of her property, which included 19 slaves and their children, whose names, ages, and family relationships were recorded. Bonne was a 37-year-old laundress and cook with three children, Florence, age 20, Juliette, 18, and Jules, 15. Celestina was 30, and Louise was 20, and both were domestic servants. Celestina had a daughter named Henriette, who was 9. Bastien, 40, and Celestin, 27, were coachmen. Devins was a 36-year-old shoemaker. Louis, 38, and Lubon, 66, were manual laborers. Nancy was 32 and had two sons named Nicholas, who was 22, and Ben, who was 13. Theodore was a 42-year-old cooper. William, 38, was a gardener, and John was a 16-year-old manservant. Jean Bose, a business manager for a French nobleman who'd had business with both Delphine's father and Blanc, wrote often to his employer in France, who liked to hear the local goings-on in New Orleans. Delphine often appeared in these letters, and Bose observed that she and Louis did not have a happy household. He said they would fight, separate, and get back together frequently. At first, they lived at Via Blanc, the plantation where Delphine and Blanc had lived, but soon they purchased a two-story house in the Vieux Carré, the oldest and most prosperous part of town. This house was massive, taking up two lots due to its three-story service wing and several outbuildings, which served as slave quarters and stables. The parties continued, and it seems the relationship soured. Delphine filed for separation in 1832, saying Louis was neglectful as well as abusive. Louis had bought a small place in Plaquemin Parish, saying it was for his medical practice, 
but he appeared to be living there most of the time. We don't know for sure if what Delphine reported was true, as the case never went to court. It was withdrawn not long after it was filed. During this tumultuous time with Louis Lallery, rumors began to spread that Delphine mistreated her slaves. At this time in Louisiana, some degree of abuse was sanctioned as necessary to keep slaves obedient, but there were laws against cruel and unusual punishment. In 1828, 1829, and 1832, Delphine was accused and called to criminal court on charges of cruelty. Unfortunately, the records of the proceedings have been lost, and the only evidence appears in the letters of Jean Bose to his employer. There is only one document that supports the accusation and subsequent court proceedings, a receipt for $300 in payment for Delphine's defense to lawyer John Randolph Grimes, dated to June 22, 1829, coincides with one of the rumored criminal accusations. It also appears Delphine sold several slaves to friends or family during the time she was investigated and later bought them back after charges were dropped. This suggests she was hiding the physical evidence. Between 1816 and 1834, when the events I'm about to tell you about took place, 19 enslaved people disappeared from Delphine's records. Meticulous records were kept of slave births, deaths, and sellings. These 19 seemingly healthy people simply disappeared without explanation. Nancy, John, Louis, Lubin, and William all of whom were recorded in the 1828 marriage contract. Arnaud, who was 58, Françoise, an elderly and hunchbacked woman, Georges, 78, Rosette, 43, Tom, 68, Paulina, 40, Amos, 24, Cyrus, 18, Jacques, 28, Matilda, 26, Mary, 34, Rauschen, 25, and Samson, age 20. There are also records for 20 deaths, most of which were young, healthy women and children. Henriette, Nicholas, Bon and her four children, Florence, Juliette, and Jules, all of whom were recorded in the 1828 marriage contract. Leontine, a young girl, Genevieve, 15, Elisa, 33, Jean-Pierre Paulin, 33, Marie-Francois, a young woman, Jeanne, 15, Zoe, 34, Maria, 20, Mary Ann, 22, Rose, 19, and Sally, age 24. No cause of death was given, but these 20 people had previously been known to be healthy. The three separate accusations of cruelty that were held against Delphine Lollery were all dropped. She was rich and socially powerful, as well as beautiful and charming in her outward appearance. Neighbors and friends, however, were aware that her slaves seemed malnourished. Gossip circulated around this observation. There was also an incident mentioned, albeit long after the fact, that a young enslaved girl was seen being chased along the balcony of the mansion by Delphine, who was wielding a whip. It was said the girl somehow fell from the balcony and died. Unfortunately, there is no documented evidence of this incident, when fire broke out at the Lollery Mansion, no one could have guessed just how bad the situation really was. Delphine was finally exposed. Before we go on, let's pause for a word from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. Audible can provide you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service as soon as you finish downloading it. And the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. So go get your free audiobook on us. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself by becoming a patron on Patreon? Over 30,000 people download this podcast every month, but only around 60 people are supporting us on Patreon. 
For a mere dollar an episode, that's $2 a month, you can get ad-free episodes, bonus behind-the-scenes info, give your opinion by answering polls, get updates on previous episode topics, and see photos of my foster cats. For $3 an episode, you get monthly outtake reels. For $5, you get a monthly pub quiz, where I quiz my husband on past episodes. For $10, you get a detailed bibliography of all the sources I've used while researching each episode. And at $20 per episode, you get a bit of miscellaneous morbidity, a short essay on a random morbid topic every month. Previously, I've reviewed horror video games and famous morbid pieces of art. All of these rewards aside, your patronage supports the podcast and keeps new episodes coming. I can't keep doing this podcast without you, so go to bit.ly slash morbidpatron, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidpatron, to choose your rewards and support the MCP. You'll have my eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast. Before we go on, I want to remind you that what you're about to hear is very upsetting and involves deep human suffering, as well as the evasion of justice. We have no personal journals from Delphine or her husband about their life at the mansion on Royal Street. Because of this lack of primary sources, we must piece together what happened between April 10th, 1834 and after, using what scant documentation we have, which includes three local newspapers, letters from neighbors, and an official statement from a judge who assisted with the rescue. On the morning of April 10th, a fire broke out on the lower level of the Lollery Mansion. It started in the kitchen, which was in the service wing of the house. The Lolleries were seen moving some of their more precious items out into the street in case the fire spread to the main house. Judge Jacques-Francois Canonja, who lived across the street, came over to see if assistance was required, along with several other neighbors. He voiced concern for the slaves that were rumored to be locked in the service wing attic. Louis Lallery as much as told him to mind his own business. As the flames gained on the service wing, Canonja and several others entered the service wing to rescue the slaves inside, having to break down locked doors to get there. Inside, they found several enslaved people chained at awkward angles to the walls, many with horrid scars and wounds that were gravely infected. One was an elderly woman, possibly Françoise, the woman with the hunchback, and one was a younger boy, possibly Ben. The names of the other victims have unfortunately been lost. The people had to be carried out on stretchers and were taken away to the guardhouse at the Cabildo, the city hall, to protect them from the Lolleries and for medical treatment. That afternoon, Delphine and presumably the rest of her family quietly fled the city by coach. The actual circumstances of their flight are not recorded, but it has been suggested that she pretended to board her coach for her usual evening ride, and then just kept going. The local French newspaper, The Bee, reported the state of the victims on April 11th, the next day. Quote, Seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, suspended by the neck, with their limbs stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. They had been confined for several months in that situation, and had merely been kept in existence to prolong their sufferings." End quote. The older woman, quote, declared to the mayor that it was she who set the house afire with the intention of terminating the suffering of herself and her companions, end quote. On April 12th, the editors of The Bee and another paper, The Courier, went to see the victims for themselves and described the scarring, the putrefying wounds filled with maggots, and the damage to the victims' necks, arms, and legs from the chains and spiked collars that they had been bound with. Around 2,000 members of the public also went to see the rescued victims, mostly because they could not believe such cruelty could have been inflicted by Delphine. Also on the 12th, the Bee published Judge Canonja's full deposition on how he found the enslaved people and the state of their health. His account verified what was previously published in the paper. That evening, a crowd gathered in front of the Lollery Mansion, demanding justice for what Delphine had done. 
When they discovered that she had fled, a destructive riot broke out. People of all social classes and races broke into the house and destroyed everything they could get their hands on. The riot continued through the night and into the next morning. It was quelled only with the assistance of the sheriff and a unit of soldiers. The Bee reported that thousands of people had participated in the assault on the Lollery Mansion. Bose also wrote about it, as he lived less than 23 paces from the house. He also mentioned that Delphine's cousin, Celeste Lanus, was lucky she did not live in town, or the mob would have moved on to her home, as she was also accused of similar atrocities. Within weeks of the incident, the story reached the national news circuit. It was publicized by the abolitionists, the people fighting to end slavery in America, as a tragedy that was facilitated and promoted by institutionalized slavery. On August 20th, Armand Sayat, the French consul to New Orleans, reported to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on the incident. He had gone to the Cabildo to see the victims, and described their bodies contorted from the chains that held them, and their wounds inflicted by whips and many other sharp instruments. He was furious that Delphine had still not been brought to justice. And where were Delphine and her family? There is documentation of Delphine traveling along the Gulf Coast all the way to New York City, and then crossing the Atlantic to France. She arrived in July and went to Louis' ancestral home in vigne sur lot His family, however, were not pleased, and in 1835 she moved to Paris, where her daughters Pauline and Laure joined her. Paulin, her son, dropped out of Yale University to come stay with them as well. Louis, however, moved to Cuba and died in Havana in 1863. Delphine's relatives managed her estate while she hid in Paris, apparently never being accepted by society there. Her children's letters suggest she never truly understood why so many people had been upset about what she had done. She died on December 7th, 1849 at the age of 64, after being ill for some time. Her children, who admitted in their letters of being afraid of her, but also how caring she could be, sold off her estate, which was worth around $7 million in today's currency. They also emancipated her remaining slaves. On January 7, 1851, Delphine's body was exhumed and transported to New Orleans to be buried at Saint Louis Cemetery likely in the tomb of Pauline Blanc's family, but records don't list exactly where she was buried. We still don't know beyond any doubt if Delphine tortured her slaves, but the evidence strongly suggests she did. There are numerous credible witnesses, such as Sean Bowes, the deposition given by Judge Kanonja, who discovered the attic prison, and Armand Sayas report. There's also an account written two years after the incident by Harriet Martineau, who spoke to the locals, and while some of it may be slightly exaggerated, some is also corroborated by the newspaper articles from the time. There are also the funeral records of the 20 slaves that died between 1816 and 1833, and the 19 that vanished from the records without a trace. Unfortunately, there is little record of what happened to the seven people who were rescued from the Lollery Mansion. We know young Ben was sold, but we do not know the fate of the others, or even who they were. It's likely Louis and Delphine's children knew what she was doing, and that they too faced her wrath if they tried to stop her. It seems Louis tried to get away by moving out and her daughters were said to look melancholy and hopeless by friends and family. Their letters suggest they feared her well into her later years. It's also a possibility that they participated, though this is less likely. Why would Delphine Lollery do this? She had grown up in an environment where slavery had long been accepted and where punishment of those slaves was normalized. Slavery was part of the culture in Louisiana at this time, and the abolition movement was slow to spread there as slaves were thought of as necessary for the plantation system to function. The local church also supported it, proclaiming to both slaves and slave owners that a good Christian slave was obedient, and if slavery were wrong, it would have been banished by that time. Delphine was also used to getting whatever she wanted possibly even thinking she deserved everything she wanted. Her personal life was quite tumultuous, being that she was married quite young and possibly due to scandal. 
she gave birth to her first child alone in an unfamiliar place, which could have been traumatizing. Her second husband was unscrupulous and involved in the slave trade, which likely reinforced her previous notions about punishment of slaves being justified. After his death, she became independent and gained complete power over herself and her affairs. She could have whatever she wanted and do whatever she wanted. It was at this point when the rumors began to fly about her cruelty as well as her charisma. This dual personality of both extremes is suggestive of some type of mental illness, which at the time was unknown and untreated. There has also been a suggestion that part of her mental illness may have had something to do with the expectations placed on Creole women at the time. Creole society reigned supreme over New Orleans at this time, and Creole women were often treated as objects themselves. Once she gained her freedom from more powerful husbands, she began to vent her frustrations. Louis was the more submissive partner in their relationship, and perhaps that is why he preferred to flee rather than address the situation. However, none of this is an excuse for what she did. She tortured people, starved them, beat them, and chose to save her furniture rather than living people during the fire. This ruthlessness and cruelty were seen as far beyond normal, as indicated by the public's extreme reaction to what she had done. If she had lived in another time and another situation, her fury would have found another outlet. But at this time and in this place, it manifested as the cruel torture of vulnerable and oppressed people. Because of her wealth, she avoided punishment both before the fire and after it. This story is horrifying enough without embellishment, but over the years it has grown into a gory tale which speaks of exploitation for entertainment purposes. It is the focus of many books and even some ghost tours. While ghost tours can be fun, in this case they also draw attention away from the real history behind one of the most difficult times in our past. But this is the subject for another podcast. However, I do recommend reading Tales from the Haunted South by Tia Mills if you want to know more about the exploitation of the history of slavery for tourism. The house at 1140 Royal Street, where the Lollaries once lived, was left destroyed and vacant for a long time after the fire. Eventually, it was purchased and slowly refurbished over the years as it passed from owner to owner until it became the building it is today. The lot behind it, which had contained the service wing and courtyard, was sold off separately, and a third floor was added to the main house. The building was a music school, a home for homeless boys, a furniture store, and finally it again became a private residence, owned briefly by actor Nicolas Cage. Unfortunately, Cage, like many of the others who owned it, suffered financial issues and had to sell the house. It's currently owned privately and not available for tours. However, many walking tours of New Orleans do stop in front of the house and relate the tale of Delphine Lallery and the tortures she inflicted on the enslaved people of her household. But it is the history, not the legends that came after, that needs to be remembered. What Delphine did to other human beings is cruelty beyond our understanding, which is why Delphine Lallery brings out our curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media. And please, please, please give us a rating on iTunes. Your shares and ratings help us reach new listeners and expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who commented, suggested topics, shared MCP posts, liked or followed the MCP on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and gave us ratings on iTunes. People like Jenna, Cristobardo94, Kay, Jasmine, Danny, Jay, Lisa, Jennifer, Allison, and Annalie, Andrew, Stephen, Melanie, Kagayaki, and Mallory all have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons, as do Holland and Stacy for upping their pledges. Thank you so much. 
Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook. So head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes and news articles, and share your own creepy stories and cute pet pictures. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you really like the MCP, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You can also give one-time donations by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the donate button. On our website, you can also find links to all our social media and sponsors, and other ways to contact us. If you'd rather contact us by mail, this address is also listed on the website. Another way to help the show is by going to our Amazon wish list at bit.ly slash morbid wish list. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.